I'm Naomi Clark, one of the faculty members here, uh, or downstairs at the NYU Game Center. Uh, and tonight uh, we have a special talk, which is going to be given by our artists and residents this semester in fall 2019 at the NYU Game Center. Uh, Marie Claire LeBlanc Flanagan, who is standing right behind me, I think. No, I'm not looking at her, so I don't know where she is relative to me. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we really like about Marie's work. Uh, and one of the reasons we invited her to be our artist in residence is that she thinks a lot about the space between people, where people are relative to each other and bodies, and how that can be um, playful, how it can be communicative and expressive. Um, let me tell you a little bit about that process. Uh, so Marie is actually our second ever artist in residence and kind of marks the beginning of uh, us sort of continuing a program that started a while back to invite uh, an artist we think is doing interesting things with play and games uh, every fall to come and join us here at the NYU Game Center, do some work uh, here in this building collaborate with students and faculty and have discussions and critiques and make their own stuff as well. Uh, and about a little more than a year ago, uh, Steph Clark uh, and I started looking at like who me, we might want to in invite for that program. And a lot of the credit for sort of like getting the start goes to Steph, who was really a sort of instrumental in um, make us continue the, this artist residence program. Uh, and the reason why I was really interested in inviting uh, Marie to be our artist in residence is because of all those intersections that she was looking at, right? Like uh, not just uh, so games as social experiences, but also how technology can be used in that process, right? So uh, Marie was doing work that involves human bodies as controllers, other types of alternative controllers, human bodies as uh, like uh, carrying recordings of what had happened in a game. Um, so that combination of sort of, of using technology in novel ways, of thinking about space in, in multiple senses uh, as part of play was really intriguing. There's also something that I think is really great about Marie's path into making games, which is that she was uh, working in Canada on a variety of artistic media. Um, she is, I believe, still the editor-in-chief of Weird Canada, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a website devoted to a, a lot of different kinds of D DIY creativity, music, books, and art. Um, and at some point, not in the not too distant past, Marie decided to start making experimental games. And uh, I guess to the credit of the international games community, but more specifically to the credit of people making games in Berlin, which is maybe right now one of the best places to be doing sort of in independent and experimental work, um, the, that community said, yes, you are now a game designer. Good job, make some games, right? And we're just like, sure, we adopt you immediately, right? Uh, and that's of such a great benefit that that happened for all of us who are making games because Marie can sort of step from doing a, a, a wide variety of artistic practices and bringing all of her experience and knowledge to working in games, which so far it sounds like she's found uh, an interesting and, uh, and fruitful place to work. But I will let her tell you more about all of that and step aside. Here's uh, Marie Claire LeBlanc Flanagan. Thank you, Naomi. That was wonderful. I, I might not speak into the microphone. Is that OK? Yeah, fine. yeah, I have a pretty loud voice, so I don't need it. But if anyone can't hear me, tell me, and I'll, I'll lean in, and I'll give you a microphone. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's a busy time of year. Um, well, I'd like to start with one thing first. I want to make sure everyone feels comfortable. Do people feel OK right now in the way that you're sitting? Are you okay? Because if you're not comfortable, I would invite you to get comfortable. Uh, if, if lying on the floor is comfortable for you, that works for me. Uh, if there's something that isn't working for you, I would like you to change it. Uh, this is kind of often the case, but I'd like to make a formal invitation uh, for you to lie on the floor, relax, sit back, do whatever you need um, to make the space work for you. I'd like to start the talk with a question. Uh, I've asked a lot of people this question. It might seem like a silly question. I promise it's not a silly question. Uh, and it might seem like an aggressive question. Some people have said that this feels like a little too aggressive. But it's not aggressive. It's, it's just a question. And so my question is this. Uh, why are you here? 
Uh, I want to know like why you're 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 here in this space. Do you know where you are? Do people know? Yeah. I want you to look around the space. Uh, I want you to look at what you see. If you can see out the windows, to look at like what you see outside. To look at each other. To see who's here and to see who's not here. If there's any kinds of people that you think are not here, that's interesting to think about as well. Uh, and I wonder if you can think about like what people do in this space and what kinds of things people absolutely do not do in this space. What's forbidden? Yeah, okay, good, I can hear you thinking about that. Uh, and if you were to do something forbidden in this space, like who would be the one to come and punish you? What are the rules and then who comes and takes you away if you do it? And I want you to think about this space as a space where things could happen. Like, what, what could you do in this space if you could do anything? What would you want to do here? In this space, in this space right here, and in this broader context here. Um, and now we thought about the here. And I want you to think also about, like, why are you here? Um, can someone volunteer to be my guinea pig for a second? Hi there. I'm going to pretend I don't know your name. Um, hi there. Hi. I'm Marie. I'm George. Nice, nice to meet you, George. Um, George, why are you why am I here? Uh, I'm here because I'm interested in your work, and I want to hear more about it. Uh, I'm here because I've given all my money to this place to be here, uh, which I don't have anymore, so if any of y'all do, please and thank you. Uh, why else am I here? Uh, this is a seat I grew up in. Uh, I want to make art in this place. Uh, I am interested in the fact that this building is here across from buildings that inflict a lot of pain on people and places in this city. Uh, and it's interesting to stare at those buildings every day and, and make stuff in them. Yeah. I am so glad you're all here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like you to take a minute and look around. Yeah, I have to. Uh, and just to ask one or two people around you. If, you. if you know them, great. But ask them why they're here. Uh, ask the people, someone, someone next to you. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's great, that's great. We're gonna wind it down a bit, slowly on the conversations. I promise the next part is just as fun. Maybe a bit weirder, but just as good. So as you end your conversation, I want you to stand up with your partner now. I want you to stand up together. If at any point in this exercise you feel uncomfortable, I want to remind you you can opt out. This is not an invasive or intense exercise. I try not to do that. But I'm a bit strange and my exercises can be a bit strange. So if you don't feel comfortable, you can stop. I promise you can stop. You know, actually, you know, insp inspired, inspired. Let, let's practice stopping, okay? So, so just stop. Try stopping. Try, try just like turning away and not doing this thing, okay? Okay, good. Everyone's practicing. Excellent. Okay, now back, back, back up. Back up with your partner, okay? If, if you're willing, okay? Um, yeah, so I want you to look at your person that you have, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to talk to them. No more talking. No more talking. I just want you to look at them. And I want you to spend five seconds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count, so don't worry. I'll keep track. But I want you to spend five seconds thinking about why they're here. I want you to focus on just them, not yourself, just them. Five seconds, why are they here? Just think about it, look at them. Okay, beautiful five seconds, and this is the last part, okay? The last thing. So now I want you to do this again, this time for 10 seconds. But anytime your focus drifts away to anything else, your hunger, your stress, anything else except for this person, I want you to say one word. I want you to say, hi. 
Do you want to practice saying hi once together? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hi, hi. Okay, okay, so now I'm going to count to 10. Really, so it'll be like a long 10 seconds, but a 10 seconds. And I want you to just focus on them. Anytime your focus is broken, just say hi and start again, okay? Okay, beautiful. Please, please thank your person. Thank your person for their attention. It's really nice. Have a seat. <laughs> so this is my this is my question. This is my question. It's taped on my wall. I had it taped outside my office, but I heard it was too aggressive, so then I taped it inside. <laughs> Um, this is the question I ask myself every day right now. I mean, right now this is the core of my practice, and my practice is always shifting, but right now this is the question that I'm always asking. And so, and so why am I here? Uh, I mean, again, this is my name, it's very long, it's Marie-Claire LeBlanc Flanagan. Uh, ostensibly I'm here because I'm the artist in residence at the NYU Game Center. Uh, if you take any embarrassing pictures tonight also, please feel free to send them to me. It's like part of my favorite like shame ritual after a talk to look at any bad pictures. Um, but, but that's not it. Why am I here? Uh, so, like I said, this is always changing for me. It's a sure sign that I've lost whatever path I'm on if my answer to this question is stuck. Why am I here is a question that should be changing. It should be growing with the people around me because narrative isn't static. And anytime you have a story, in my opinion, that makes a ton of sense and is really clear and is really clean, you're telling yourself some lies. Uh, so this is always changing, but right now for me, the reason I'm here working on experimental games is because I believe that we're moving towards a future where we're going to be connected in unimaginable ways. Uh, like we're connected right now you know, by our bacteria, by the water we drink, by these massive corporations that seem hell-bent to destroy us and shred us to bits. Um, you know, by the air, by the water, by all these things we're connected. But I think that there's going to be more and more and more and more with technology. And I want to encourage playful ways of being in those spaces. I want to just like wake up those spaces between people and enliven them. And I do this through experimentation, expression, and connection, which we'll talk about more later. Um, but this is, what I, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm here right now. Um, it'll make a lot more sense when you hear the rest of the context. So my talk tonight is not going to be a hot take. Who knows, who, who knows what a hot take is? Can someone define it? Anyone feel like defining it? No. No, I don't know what it is either. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. It's like, a, it's like a, a, an opinion that is like controversial or like uh, a new idea that you're you know, trying to dish out. Uh, and share with the world. Beautiful. Yeah, dish, dish is the opportune word, I think. It's, a, it's an internet thing. Um, this is not a hot take. I'm not, I'm not going to come and like a TED talk you like this or something. I'm talking about my work. I'm understanding it as I go. I have personal opinions. This is going to be more of a hot tangle, which is my natural state. Uh, kind of a mess. Um, yeah. This is an evening of hot tangles. Uh, so a little bit about me. Now, Naomi told you but I feel like it's interesting to know a bit about my story. Uh, I have spent my entire life uh, kind of like focused on one priority, uh, which is not art, uh, it's not even community. It's really like trying to pass for normal. Anyone else trying to do that? <laughs> yeah, a couple, couple normal, <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know, like I know that some people want to be abnormal and other people want to be normal. I'm always trying to pass for normal. And I sometimes wonder if it's because I grew up in a small town. Did anyone else grow up in a small town? Small town people? Big city people? I'm so envious of you. <laughs> like, you can grow up a little bit anonymous, you know? It's a survival thing in a small town. Like, everybody's weird, but everyone's hiding it. Um, and when I was growing up, my parents had this open door policy. Uh, they liked to bring home strange people. So they would find people that were strange, and they would bring them into my house. Uh, and for them, the weirder the people were, the better. And when I think about why I'm an artist, I think about one of these people in particular. Uh, I called him Pumpkin Doodle. He was a man who lived in his van in my yard for a while. 
And he was a person who believed, like, since I, as long as I can remember, that I was an artist. Uh, he just believed in me. From the beginning, he was like, you're an artist, Marie. And he would scavenge things at yard sales or from trash bins, I don't know, and bring them to me and help me make art. He taught me about mixing colors. He taught me about expressing. Uh, and he taught me a lot of things, you know? I think he was a little bit sick sometimes. He was a Cold War, actually, this is going on YouTube. Never mind, never mind. He had a backstory. He served in the US military during the Cold War. Um, I won't say his real name. Uh, but one day he came to me and he was like, Marie, why aren't you making any art? And I said, well, I have nothing to make art with. You know, I've got no pastels, I've got nothing. And he said, Marie, anything in this world is an art supply. You can make art out of anything. And he brought me into the kitchen and we started bringing down all the utensils and all the food and making like the most horrendous mess of art on the kitchen floor. So this is when I look back to like my beginning of art, I think about this. Uh, I had a bit of a troubled teenagehood. Anyone else? Trouble, trouble, yeah. Okay. I mean, I moved out of my parents' house in the middle of high school, dropped out, went to art school, uh, didn't know how to take care of myself. I thought that like personal hygiene and eating were optional. Uh, I felt very betrayed by the system, and so I thought I would test everything myself. Um, but eventually I survived it, and I, and I went and I got an undergraduate education, which is as far as I went in school. Uh, honestly, it's probably as far as I'll ever go. Uh, for money reasons, uh, it just doesn't make sense for me, though I love the community. I got an education in something called Global Studies with a focus on communities and identities. And basically, as long as I kept my grade point average above 80%, I could take whatever I wanted. Uh, so I took feminist geography, and I took something called post-colonial theory, and I took multimedia and design, and I kind of designed a program around the idea of identities, expression, and communities. Uh, I have a lot of work background. I've done the most degrading and low-paying work. Uh, I mean, maybe not the most, but I certainly have had bags of wet food garbage explode over my head while I sang a song that I made up called My Life is a Depressing Hellhole. So pretty far along the line. Uh, I've also done game design. I've been paid for consulting work. I've worked in experimental education and arts communities. So why games? Uh, and like, why games related to connection and community? Well. I mean, to understand that, Naomi mentioned it, but I, I want to bring you back, so maybe I guess like four years ago or something. I was living in Kitchener, Ontario. Does anyone know where that is? Waterloo, Ontario. Kitchener. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very impressive. I was living in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, famous for, uh, it's the home of Blackberry, the big company. Um, and I was working full-time for the city on an arts and culture website, trying to understand why people didn't go out, basically. And this was a full-time job, and then after work, I ran this nonprofit, uh, from which I did not pay myself, despite it being more than a full-time job. Uh, so it was a nationally incorporate, non incorporated nonprofit with 600 volunteers working on a variety of projects related to experimental music, art, zines, this kind of thing. We put on shows and festivals that traveled across the country. We built community resources and tools, which I was most excited about, including how-to guides and message boards, and even a distribution service for LPs, uh, records, cassettes, and CDs. Uh, I also had a, I made this day for drone music. Who knows what, how, what a drone sound is? Can anyone make one for me? Yeah, 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 perfect. So you're welcome every May. You're welcome to come join us anywhere in the world. I heard the other day that Lamont Young, who is a famous drone artist, used to have parties and you had to make drone sounds to get into the party. That there was this like vestibule time where you had to make drones to go into the drone party and I thought that was the most magical thing. Uh, I also worked on this website. We won the award for the best music website in Canada, which was hilarious because we were not. Uh, we just had a very passionate community uh, who voted for us a number of times. And I was just like working. I was working all the time and I was miserable. I just worked, work, work. And I thought, I thought, what is the opposite of work? Whatever that is, I want to do that. And, uh, and the answer I had was play. Uh, so I needed a change. I needed a huge change. I needed to leave my job, definitely. I felt like I needed to leave the country, definitely, to escape this kind of monolithic thing that I had built with people. Uh, I, needed, I felt like I needed to leave the continent, actually, and my entire life behind. So I went to Berlin. Uh, Berlin, you know, the famous city of graffiti. Uh, and I, I arrived there. I arrived in Berlin. I had no idea what I was doing. I felt like I made a terrible mistake. I was sitting on a suitcase, my giant red jacket. And I was like, I don't know how to make games. 
I don't even know how to play games. I don't even know how to use a game controller. What am I doing? What am I doing here? And then I, like, I did what people do in, this year, in these years, and I searched. I was like, how to make games. And I found out that there were things called game jams. Uh, and so I was like, I'm gonna search for a game jam, and I found this. Uh, so this was like right after I arrived. I arrived, I think, October 21st or something. So I emailed them, the Wikimedia Free Knowledge Game Jam, and I said, uh, I'd like to volunteer for your, for your events. And they said, you should just participate. And I said, I, I don't know how to participate. I don't have any skills. I just want to come and learn what a game jam is. And they said, just participate. And I said, no, I want to volunteer. And they said, okay. But then I showed up at the game jam, and this was the name tag waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was terrifying, you know, honestly. Like, I didn't know what a game designer was. I had no idea. Again, I didn't even know how to use a controller. I didn't know what free knowledge was. I didn't know what open data sets were. But at one point in the game jam, they said, okay, anyone who has a team, go sit with your team. And almost everyone in the room did that. And then they said, anyone who doesn't have a team, go up to the mic and pitch an idea. And maybe people will like your idea and they'll come work with you. And I was like, that's what I have to do. This is the only way I'm gonna survive this experience. Uh, so I got up to the mic and I pitched like six games in succession, like just really quick. And uh, I, I, some people liked one of the ideas, I think because I had so many. And I gathered this team of people and we all started working together on this game, which was, uh, we were working with the textile museum, uh, the German textile museum, to make like a pattern matching game. Because I thought, that sounds easy-ish. Uh, and we were trying to work together, but like eventually at some point, like the two developers in the team decided they wanted to use different languages. And they secretly and silently split up and went to different rooms and didn't tell anyone. Um, but luckily in the meantime, myself and the other teammates had been making pro paper prototypes and making sounds and like working it out and play testing. And so when it came time to play, even though we didn't have a game, we just had a, we just had a paper prototype, we won third place. <laughs> Which was incredible, honestly. Um, and I felt very inspired by this. Like this was a big moment for me. Uh, but I knew I would never survive in games without community. I'm very excited about communities. I don't know if it's obvious from my education and the games and everything, but I'm very excited about communities. Uh, I feel like I always want to make a disclaimer, which is that lots of communities are toxic and broken, and all communities have broken things about them. Um, but they're also like magical places, and they're kind of like the thing out of which everything good in my life has come. So when I got to Berlin, the first thing I did was look for communities. I reached out to the School of Machines Making and Make Believe. Has anyone heard of this school? Okay, oh, one person, that's nice in the back. Uh, it was someone who went to the School for Poetic Computation here in New York. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, okay, more people. Uh, it's like a kind of schools for art, technology, design, and connection. Uh, anyway, the person went to that school and then she got really excited about it and went and made her own school in Berlin. So I started working there in exchange for tuition so I could take the classes. I started working for Amaze Berlin. Do people know what this is? Yeah, a few people. It's an experimental games festival in Berlin. It's a, it's an awards show and an exhibition. It's a hot mess. It's really fun. Uh, that's me, like, hiding behind the microphone there. I started working for Amaze. I got involved in the art games community, which was a meetup, which was just, like, brand new. People excited about video games as a form of interactive art. And also the creative code community, who are just people excited about the possibility with code uh, and art and social change. And I started working, basically, right away. Uh, the first game I made... Uh, this is a, a GIF of some people playing. Uh, it's a really happy GIF for me because these are two students whose professor forced them to come to this festival. They didn't want to come. They didn't want to play. They were walking around kind of, kind of sullenly. And then they started playing the game, and I, got, I felt so moved by this, uh, by like, their obvious joy. Um, and this was the beginning of everything for me. I made this game. It was the only game I think that I've ever made that I properly documented with like a trailer and some, and some write-up. Uh, and I started getting invited to festivals and to conferences all around Europe and sometimes around the world uh, to work on new things and talk to people about things, uh, which was really incredible because for me that was like more communities, uh, more possibility. So anyway, I'm still working. Uh, and what am I working on now? Well, I'm obviously the artist in residence here. Uh, but when I, when I think about this, like what is an artist in residence? I mean, the first question for me as the person who has to occupy this title is this. Uh, what is an artist? Uh, any artists here? Who says, who says you're an artist? 
Okay, pretty good. Who's not an artist? Like, not at all. No, no way. Zero. Oh, one, one, one. So nice. Um, um, anyway, anyone want to define this? What's an artist? Please feel free to just shout it out. Yeah, I agree. So that's what I say. That's what I say. Exactly. Someone who is making art. Uh, but of course, the next question is pretty obvious. Um, as someone who has to occupy this role, what is art? Me. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. You can, like, we can talk about this later. I don't know. Um, but as an artist, I feel like a lot of people ask me the same question, and this question that they ask me is this. So what have you made? And then the next question when I say I make experimental games is they say, do you have anything I can buy in the app store? <laughs> <laughs> and I say, no, it's free on GitHub or Itch, maybe if you're lucky. <laughs> Uh, and I say it's a broken pile of code which may not work on your computer and also like usually there are installation components that they don't have uh, So it's just kind of like play it now and enjoy it and then forever hold your peace about that And a few times people have actually offered to pay for my transportation and accommodation to bring projects to them to their Homes, I guess. I've never said yes to this because I value my personal safety um, but I find it really funny this obsession with products like Demonstrate your value. Show me something I can buy. Like, I don't think they even want to own it. They just, they want to get it. Um, and so I find myself wondering a lot, like, why, why does, like, the work of art matter more than the work of making art? Because for me, it doesn't at all. Uh, like, why do we care more about the objects and the broader context and impact of the word, world, on the world? And, like, what if we examined process like as intensely as we examine product. And I know I'm not the first person to ask this question, but like for me, this is a big question right now. Um, this is what I'm thinking about a lot. Like I'm sure in the university, lots of people are asking this question all the time, but on the streets, people are saying, what did you make? And is it available in the app store? <laughs> so anyway, what is making art? Um, I always like to hear about people's practice. Like if you had to choose, okay, so I'm gonna make you choose. You have two choices. So one is you get to see the art or experience the art, but you don't get to hear anything about the practice or know anything about the context. And the other is you get to hear the artist talking about the practice and context, but you don't get to see the art at all. So choosing, uh, choosing practice or choosing art. Who chooses practice? Okay. And who chooses art? Oh, it's very split. I mean, I want both, of course, but if I have to choose, personally, I choose practice. Because uh, often, I mean, occasionally art will transcend that, and I guess that's the point, but generally, I'd rather hear about practice. I want to hear about, like, where do these materials come from? Like, for example, this computer that I'm using right now for the slides, like, whatever this stuff is, and, like, these things, and these chairs, like, where did this come from? And, and like, where did Keynote, this Apple application that I'm using, come from? And what about this body? Like, what it, where did this body come from? And like, how does it relate to all your bodies? Um, this is what I want to know about. And speaking of the body, I often wonder, like, why do so many artists look like this? Like, just like drained and exhausted, burning out and awful. And for me, this is kind of like a question of practice. And we talk about artists in culture in general, like, as if they're, as if they're a single self. Um, and like the work is some product and they're removed, but like obviously we know that artists and art aren't removed from anything. Uh, they're entirely contextual. And all work is situated in the body and all bodies are situated and defined by communities. Uh, it's oppressive, honestly. I mean, it's exciting too, but it's also like deeply oppressive the way that we rely on each other. Uh, if each other are not very nice, for example. Um, but it's true. Anyway, but this is a nice community. So speaking of communities, let's talk about, about residents. Uh, so what is a resident? Anyone? I'm a resident. Does that mean I'm sleeping? I wish I was sleeping here. I'm sleeping with some cockroaches on the Upper West Side. <laughs> no, no, they're dead, they're dead, don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I'm a resident. This is on my whiteboard. This is a bunch of other weird drawings. Uh, I think about myself as a, as a visitor as an occupant, as a guest, um, I'm occupying the space, and like definitely as a guest, you know, you have to be invited to do an artist in residency. Though I was thinking, like, 
what if you just invited yourself sometimes? Uh, lately, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, but also, like, to be a visitor or a guest, you kind of have to be an alien. Like, people who are in a place aren't, I, I don't know, like, to, to, yeah, so to be a visitor, you have to be an outsider. And to be a guest, you have to be an alien. And so it's kind of like this strange tension. And it's weird because you're like, at least I am, I'm occupying the space, so I'm like stepping into your lives. Like some of you are, are new students, first year, so you're also stepping into the space equally, like you're also aliens. But like I'm stepping into people's lives, I'm stepping into relationships and into culture, and it's a very strange thing to reside in this, in a step in. Um, and so how do I reside? I mean, as a resident, like, there was talk of relationships, but like these were my two main commitments. So there was this. I wanted to be here, I promise, but there was this, I have to do this. And then there was this, this was a commissioned uh, exhibition, which was kind of amazing. Uh, these, these were like the requirements on, on, the, on the list. Um, and then there was all this freedom. Like, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Like, escaping the stress of things. Like, what do you want to make? Uh, and this is kind of what I've been doing here. I think it's interesting to kind of know how I've been occupying this space. So first time occupying space, I spent a lot of time just kind of like working shoulder to shoulder with people, like kind of being present, close, but not on top of, you know, like next to. Uh, sitting in on classes, uh, guest teaching once, and guest speaking. I've extended invitations to people, so I have open office hours, and I try and like create circumstances where people will come see me, like cookies and snacks. Uh, I try and encourage community bleed, so I've invited people that I know into the university, and I've brought people from the university out into the world, including going to the climate chart march with one student. Uh, we got separated eventually, but, but it was pretty incredible to go with a student who I just met to the climate march. Uh, lots of play testing, uh, and I'm doing a couple workshops in the next few weeks, just based on specific things that people have asked me for help with. So assertiveness, uh, well, I'll tell you in a minute, but also, Tiny play experiments. This is the thing I'm most excited about that's happening right now, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the workshops, uh, basically I've been asked for help because on the very first day I was like, you know what's useful? Assertiveness skills. Uh, and so since then people have been like, how do I assert myself? Uh, so I'm gonna do a little tiny workshop at this very stressful time where people are forced into these groups. Students are, I mean it's not forced, they wanna be there, but like you're working with people, maybe there's clashes, almost always. So finding ways for people to assert themselves in ways that don't implode everything. Uh, and then also like a relaxation workshop because being someone who's high stress, I've learned a lot about that. But yeah, also the tiny play experiences. Uh, so this one, I'm not gonna give any spoilers. It's in one week at the winter show. I really hope you all come, it's very fun. I'm collaborating with a bunch of students and we're all kind of collaborating wildly and figuring it out as we go. So like surprises for everyone. Uh, so this one we, have hollowed out kind of like an old busted up arcade cabinet a bit so that we can put a person inside um, and their hand sticks out. Anyway, I won't tell you anything really more about it, but here's like a little sneak peek of us bringing it down to IPTP to saw the insides out. Uh, and a little bit of the backstory that we were working on uh, with like the Mechanical Turk and the Amazon striking workers uh, and this idea of like humans and androids and machines and like fake machine learning algorithms. I don't know, we have all kinds of like fun ideas. Uh, and then also this one, which is like a, just a tiny dance party in this very small room. So it's a dance party for one person and we're gonna have a bouncer and music and lights. Um, it's basically a closet. Um, are you going there alone? <laughs> uh, yeah. And also this project, which is an RFID project that I won't talk about for legal reasons. It's best if you don't know anything about it. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is, this is how I'm occupying. Kind of an alien visitor, an outsider occupant, a stranger guest. Um, and this is how I'm doing artist in residence. I see my space here as a resident as kind of like this magical space because I'm an outsider, I'm an alien. I have, I'm like both outside and I'm inside. I can challenge things and make space for play. Uh, and I have this opportunity for big impact in relationships, but I also have like no consequences really because it's gonna end and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have to leave. So like what I do is kind of this like incredible space. I have no job to lose, I have no tenure to lose. I, I don't think tenure is a thing here, but like I have nothing really, just like kind of a lot of joy and curiosity. And it's a, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful, um, yeah. 
So the final thing, I promise this will be a talk about my art. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is my practice making art. Um, and I'm going to warn you that if there are any hot takes simmering up inside me, because I never know what I'm going to say sometimes, they'll probably come out in this part. Uh, I'll try not to. Uh, so I made this for you. This is uh, the steps of my practice. It definitely, 100%, really does not look like that. It's a hot mess of stuff that intersects uh, and breaks and does not, it does not look like that, but this is a good way to model it or think about it. Um, certainly all my projects start with a problem. Every single project I work on, including Arcade Friends, or Arcade Friend, including like the dance, tiny dance room, including everything I've ever been involved in, I'm always, except for maybe this pattern matching game, which like the problem was just like an overwhelming anxiety of how do I make games, um, I always start with a problem. And I don't mean like a pretty problem, like a cute little problem, I mean like something deeply personal and shameful that I absolutely don't want to talk about at all, but then for some reason I force it out into the world. <laughs> um, yeah, so you might, if, if, uh, as you'll see, I make a lot of work, and you might say, well, Marie, you make a lot of work, so does that mean you have a lot of problems? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, anyone here have a lot of problems? Problems? Oh, good, good company. So lots of good art coming out of you, I guess. Um, I have no shortage of problems. Uh, for example, for example, I have a really hard time accepting anything as truth, or like accepting anything. So for example, like this word even, just like yes. Uh, when I see this word yes, I think yes, good, yes, yes, very positive. And then immediately I start thinking, why yes? Like what, why, why yes, why not, why not no? Why do we have such a yes culture? Why are we all saying yes to everything? It's like yes is gonna be the death of us. It's gonna exhaust us. We need more no's in this world that's like so broken. We need to say absolutely not, no way. And so then I'm like, no, no is the answer. And I, and I said, no. But the minute that's up there, you think, oh, I'm happy now, right? I'm not happy. The minute that's up there, I'm like, no. Maybe the problem with this world is this, like, this word no. And maybe we need like, more like maybes or some days or like I'll think about it or yeses. I don't know. And so some people might say like, wow, Marie, you're a contrarian. You can't really like settle on anything. And I would agree with those people. It's true, I am a contrarian. But then I think, would a contrarian say that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm stuck. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, my whole life, the number one thing that I do is at all costs, hide the difference. All my life, every single day, I spend 80% of my energy, literally 80% of my energy, trying to hide any kind of differences. I don't know why this is. Anyone else do this? You don't have to put up your hand, actually. You can if you, like, you can do it like a tiny one. <laughs> yes, me. <laughs> um, every thought that I have, anything that I'm externalizing to the world, I have to put through a translation. Uh, otherwise, I might like lick somebody's face, honestly. <laughs> I might do some weird things. I have no idea. I just know that like the way that I behave doesn't make sense and it doesn't get the reaction that I want. And so I have to like every time stop and think and think, Okay, I like this person, I want them to know that I like them. I'm gonna say something nice, not something alienating and mean. Uh, this kind of thing, you know, like, I don't know, everything has to kind of go through a translation. And it's very difficult. Uh, and lately I've been thinking, like, why is it like this? Why do I do this? And like, why is it so shameful to be different? It is shameful, right? Like it is, I think it is, we have a lot of shame kind of like tied up in difference. Uh, let's do a little thing actually. This, we'll see if this is nice. Who wants to be a volunteer? All you're going to have to do is stand up, but it might be a bit awkward. Okay. Okay. You just stand up? Yeah, just stand up. Okay, I want everyone to listen to you. Okay, very good. You can sit down again. And someone, someone else? Anyone else? I 
mean, the reason I did that exercise is because I feel like for the people who stood up, they maybe noticed that they were different <laughs> um, from everybody else. And I want to say something of a difference, and that is that like a single person is never different. A single person is always okay. And difference is something that only comes out in communities. Uh, difference doesn't exist alone. It's not in a vacuum. And so I think that that has something to do with the shame. Is like the shame comes from the community and from not feeling safe. Uh, it's definitely shameful to feel insecure, and, and difference can make you feel pretty insecure. So then I'm like, well, why is it shameful to be insecure? Like, of course we're insecure. We're we're socially insecure. We have less connections than we ever have. We're environmentally insecure. Our world is actually literally kind of like melting and imploding right now. We're financially insecure. Everybody has debt and things are really bad. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I'm just saying like, of course we're insecure. Of course we're overwhelmed. I mean like, this is my daily state. This is how I live. This is how I live my life. These are the words how I would describe it. I have like major problems with executive function. You wouldn't know it. Everyone that I know says that I'm highly organized, but it's because I have these like really complicated systems to make things work for me. Uh, I'm overstimulated. Like even like going out for a coffee with someone will drain me so much that I have to like spend like two hours with my noise canceling headphones on. I mean, this is how I live. This is how I feel. This is not what I put on my resume. This is what I put on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's equally true, it's equally true. But anyway, the problems, the problems for me, every work, this is kind of the most important thing and the only important thing is that there's a question and there's a problem at the beginning and that's how it starts. So for example, that first work I showed you, my question was, why do I feel so alone? Why do I feel so different and separated? Why can't I connect with people? Like, why is collaboration so hard? Is there something wrong with me or is everybody feeling this way? How do people work together? And so I made this project, I mean, I made this project closer, and it was literally a game about the spaces between two people. It was like, how do we navigate this? Basically, it's just an infinite scroller where you're navigating through spikes, but instead of using your controller, you're using your body. But instead of using your body, you're using the negative space between your body and another person's body. So you're together collaborating through it. Here's like the first playable prototype, so you can kind of get a look for it. Uh, this is Mr. Fingers, it's a beautiful song. Why is it so hard to connect with people? Another problem. Why is it so hard to say what we mean? Does anyone else struggle with communication? Any communication? <laughs> I really struggle. I really struggle, as you know, as you heard. Uh, and I thought, I feel like my words just get in the way. Like, what if I could just have my feelings and have them just come out of me and I didn't have to do anything? Uh, like, what if my feelings were just expressed? Uh, what if I could just be honest without having to say anything and just, like, let my body speak? And so I made this game Ozcult, which is like more of a prototype, like in a technical sense it didn't work perfectly, but it worked well enough. And basically it used like biosignals, so like your uh, electrical conductivity, your pulse, and uh, so like your electrical conductivity is like your sweatiness, like how agitated you are in a way, potentially, and then also your facial expressions. I used this new tool then uh, by this woman, Rebecca Fiebrink, called Wekinator. Has anyone heard of this? It's like a tool for machine learning for artists, basically. So I made this little game where you're basically like playing someone else like an instrument. And the idea that I have was that like you could use this for seeing how you're making someone feel, you could use this for like sexy times, for understanding your partner, you could use this for like moving, like a boss walks into a room and all the employees go from like la 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 to vroom vroom. And you could kind of know like how you're making people feel, like how the truth feels. Uh, or another question, why are events so overwhelming? 
I was going to a lot of festivals and events and conferences, and I would always get totally overwhelmed and drained, like to the point of a total crash. Two days before and two days after were just totally written out, and often I'd have to leave early and get totally overwhelmed. And I was thinking, like, how can we make self-care? Everyone was talking about self-care, and I was like, how do we make this a community responsibility? This isn't an individual thing. And so I worked with Bree Code and Lindsay Raymakers, and we designed this dream room, which was basically like a, a soft space inside the bigger party where there's like a tea service and an interactive installation and soft cushions and people kind of like being custodians of the space, like creating this ritual for you. And basically it was like a space of co-care and self-care inside a festival without having to leave it, um, but, but, but removed. And I was thinking more about this, like can we design playful ways to care for each other? And I made my very first escape room, which uh, I was inspired by hating escape rooms. So basically, escape rooms just don't work for me because I think the puzzles feel arbitrary. And I'll never put my brain to work on something that I don't have fine meaning in. Uh, so that's just like my state. I don't know. Maybe other people experience this. Maybe not. But I made an escape room where you actually bring your own problems and you navigate them together. It's kind of like group therapy in the age where therapy is so expensive and therapists are often so bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so after the problem, I do learning. So learning is a process of research for me. Uh, anyone who's ever had a purse or a number of purses or a backpack will relate to this. It's like the bigger time, the bigger the time slot I have for research, the more I'll fill it. Anyone else do this? Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if it's a year, I'll take a year researching. Uh, this is maybe the most important step in my process other than problem. Uh, I'll give a few quick examples. So. For example, I made a game called Burst with the Berlin Smell Lab. If there's an art form that exists in Berlin, there's a community for it. So I met up with these smell artists and I was making smell games. Um, and basically I was researching like augmented bodies and implants. I went to a, a conference on like people who were putting like a compass inside their chest so that when they face north it would vibrate. Uh, and I got really obsessed with the sense of smell and like the nose as a, as a sensor. Uh, it was incredible. Like, for example, did you know that people smell in stereo? So like, you use both your nostrils to like navigate where a smell is coming from. Or like, I read about this professor who had his students. This is pretty, actually, pretty weird. But had his students like sniff through grass for traces of food, just like dogs. And he found the students were just as good at the dogs as like smelling for food. Uh, yeah, anyway, there's, it's fascinating. I have like 10 pages if, if you're interested. But yeah, so I made this, uh, this weird smell game, which was a mixed success. It was pretty fun to make, but uh, basically there's a story going on and you're popping the balloons and the smells are like bursting out at you. And uh, people wanted more smell. I, was, I went a little too subtle, I think. Uh, and I ended up actually like designing uh, smell games for this Russian museum because I guess I became like a smell game expert <laughs> in the process of research. Uh, or like another example of research, I made this VR game. It's one of the few VR games I've made. I was working on this VR conference for money to pay my rent and I was like really kind of overwhelmed by the VR hype or something and then I was like really curious about other realities and dimensions and permanence of bodies and uh, I did a bunch of research, and I, what I really wanted to make was some game where you could enter alternate dimensions, like unfolding on themselves, uh, but I guess that's technically kind of complicated. Uh, so I made this, uh, which was also kind of interesting, but maybe like the edgiest game I've ever made. So basically it's called Other Hands, and you go into this beautiful little room in VR, and it's like really beautifully lit, and then I use this glitch with the leap motion so that like you're basically like making these sculptures with your hands in space. So anytime you hold your hand somewhere for a second, it adds a hand and you have this like beautiful sculpture. It's so peaceful and nice. And then all of a sudden, there's this sound. It's like, it's a fly. that's come into your beautiful art room where you're making sculptures. And if you, if you, if you decide to kill the fly, uh, something happens to you. So if you decide to kill it, oh, where's my vid? Oh, there it is. If you decide to kill the fly, uh, the game ends. So if you can just go here and make the art as long as you want, but if you kill the fly, the game ends and there's a tattoo artist standing by. And she says, you killed the fly. The fly's not dead, it's a virtual fly, but you're real and this was a real thing that you did in your body, and so we'd like to mark this fly on you forever to commemorate your relationship with the fly. 
And she, I mean, it was an option, of course. I'm not tattooing people against their consent. <laughs> and I even turned away a couple of people who seemed intoxicated. Uh, but one person, this is their first tattoo. Can you imagine that? Like, you're like, I don't know, I went to some weird art show and I got carried away. Um, but yeah. Another example, the biggest research I've ever done was for a game I made called Common, which I made for a contemporary art festival. Uh, and I researched trust in decentralized communities. If you want to talk about it later, I'll talk your ear off. But I even ended up going to the World Crypto Economic Forum and participated in a hackathon there to understand what people meant by decentralized and trustless systems. It turns out that, like, they're just lying. Like, there's no such thing as a trustless system that doesn't, every system involves some trust, by the way. But I made this game where you, over a month with an entire city where you could connect with anyone uh, as long as you met up with them physically and you're making these connections and you're maintaining them against an entropic force which is threatening to continuously decay all things and throw you out into the endless void of nothingness unless you maintain your community connections. Um, yeah. So the next step in my process is collapse. This doesn't necessarily happen here. It can happen anywhere. Uh, but basically, I like to factor it in. At some point, I'll always overscope, overwhelm, and totally crash. Has anyone done this in your creative practice? Oh, good. Yeah. I don't want this to be part of things, but I feel like it should be there on the list. I put it at three. It seems safe. It can happen more than once. Um, design. So I'm not going to talk too much about design, because actually, that would be its own entire talk. But for me, the design part actually comes out of the research and learning part. So everything that's going to be is formed there through that practice of research. Uh, I shape it into something. I build it. So for Closer, for example, this was kind of like the very first. I don't drink, so my friend is having two beers uh, for me. Uh, but this was the very first thing. So just this line between us and this shared ball like representing our connection and these sounds that were shifting depending on what we were doing. I mean, this is a real song, but yeah. So the next step is rebuilding. Uh, so normally this is where I talk about how great it is to play test and do iterative design. But actually I'm like really sick of people being excited about iterative design. So instead I thought I would just share with you three or four problems. I think it's four actually, it's gonna say three. But three or four problems that I have with iterative design. Uh, why it's broken for me, um, even though I think it is the best solution right now. So one problem, oh wait, should I tell you? Does anyone not know what I mean when I say iterative design? It's okay if you don't know. Okay, thank you, yeah. So what I mean when I say that is like building something as quickly as you can and then testing it. So with games, that's like building a prototype, play testing, building a prototype, play testing. Um, it's just like iterating over your solution over and over again. Um, so the alternative traditionally has been something called waterfall in software, which is just like doing a bunch of research, having this huge plan, and then implementing it, which sometimes hilariously fails because things are like 40 years over scope. And so they do this research, and then they build something that works for no one and is broken by the end. Um, so iterative design has its uses, but I don't want to talk about those. I want to talk about the problems. So one problem with iterative design is that I find when I'm doing it, I don't have any trust in my own vision. I'm like really focused on is it working and is it working is never is it working for me. It's always is it working for its, my play testers. Another problem is I get stuck in make mode. So I don't go back to my question or like why I'm doing what I'm doing. I get stuck in like making things and making things fast. And speaking of which I find myself way too quick to shift. So like if I have six play testers say that it doesn't work. I might not notice that they're all game designers and that they're the wrong audience and I might just like shift my direction and listen to them. And finally that I find that with iterative design like it's really nimble and it's fast and it favors existing power structures. It's less experimental sometimes which is totally counterintuitive but somehow this is what happens. Uh, the final step in my, in my process is sharing. I think sharing is really important. Who here doesn't share their work ever? Who? Wow. Okay, that's impressive too though. I never share my music, so, that, so I relate to that in that way, but for me, sharing this work is critical because it comes out of communities and goes into communities. It's kind of like shaped by that. Uh, I try and make a, a video or something, well, this is follow the video I made for the commissioned work, as quickly as possible, but I actually like to spend a year or two doing my public written documentation because I, 
I'm really excited about what happens in the mind over time with artwork. Uh, I'll show you like an example of a, of a quick video. So if you came to No Quarter, you probably have played this. Video documentation is good for, for games because it, uh, it's as close as you can get. Written documentation is hard. Photos can work. But video, I think, is the best. But talking about product, video is the best. For the process, I actually find that words work really well. We're almost done, everyone. We're back to the last question, which is the first question, which is, uh, why am I here? So for me, another way of asking this question, which I hope you've asked yourself now, is what do I care about? And for me, what I care about is, is these things. I care about expression, I care about experimentation, and I care about connection. That's why I'm here. Uh, I believe that creative expression is how we shape ourselves. That person who said you weren't an artist, I, I feel like you are. I'm not going to take away your agency, I believe you, but, but I feel like some kind of creative expression is how we realize our potential as human beings. Like, I think it's that important. Uh, and I think each of us has creative capacity, and that shaping creative work is how we can shape ourselves. Uh, I believe in experimentation. If work doesn't feel experimental, I simply just like, won't do it. Uh, experimental is this really big word. It can mean a lot of things. But by this, I just mean like some investigation, some curious exploration, some questions. Experimentation has some big problems also. I love criticizing the things I love, if you haven't noticed. Uh, so experimental work will always be misunderstood. The more experimental the work, the more misunderstood it will be. If you do like a little experimental thing and package it in a non-experimental box, you're probably pretty good. People will understand you. But the more experimental, the harder it will be to understand. Experimental work will fail. Uh, experiments lead to magical things, but the same space we leave for magic, we have to leave for disaster. And at least half the time, if not more, it's just going to fail. More, 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 more. <laughs> and also experimental work has this tendency to like end up being frontierism or something. Uh, it's like some cowboy, weird colonizer stuff, which is deeply uncomfortable and bad. Um, if you're experimenting, like I find like some people when they're experimenting, they're like, I'm experimenting on the world and I'm some kind of objective thing. It's not like that. Like I think all exp good experimental work should be re in relation to the frontier of the self, if there's any frontier. Like not this pioneering stuff, it's so weird. Finally, connection. So like I said, I believe we're moving towards a future where we're gonna be connected in completely unimaginable ways. Uh, Let's do something really quick. Okay, so I want you to, I'm gonna to count to three, and on three, so one, two, two, uh, I want you to point at someone in the audience that you know. If you don't know anyone, you can point at me, uh, but if you do know me, don't point at me, okay? So, ready? Are you ready? Someone that you know. One, two, three. Okay, and now I want you to do this one more time. On the count of three, three being the point, I want you to point at someone that you wish you knew or someone that you wish you knew better, okay? Someone that you wish you knew or someone that you wish you knew better. So I'm going to do it on three. Okay, so we're going to do one, two, go. Okay, so one, two, three. Is anyone pointing at themselves? Each other? Are you pointing at each other? Any, any mutual connections? No, I'm always hoping for that. Beautiful. Thank, thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, I want to. I want to make spaces. I want to make this play in the spaces between us. I want to use community and collaboration and cool co-creation. I want to experiment with all these things. In my work, I've gone to a lot of game and play festivals and events and communities to explore this and also others. I'm also critical of it. Do people have, do people recognize this? Yeah, the tyranny of structure or structuralnessness. Um, it's an essay. It's about how about power relations in communities and how about sometimes like an apparent lack of structure can hide secret structure. So it's just like, oh, we're totally wild. We do whatever we want. But then actually there are secret rules and structures and people in power who are organizing things and you can't control them at all. Um, yeah, we are connected. Ultimately, like if you only walk away from one thing other than why are we here uh, from this talk, I hope that you'll walk away from this. Uh, we're all connected. Independence is a total lie. Our physical spaces are shared. 
like the water, the air is shared. I'm not going to call those things resources because I find that kind of disgusting. Uh, the spaces between us, like between all of us, is not empty space. It's living, active space. Uh, and with new technologies, I feel like we're only increasingly linked in new ways. Um, and for me, this is a bit scary because, well, maybe I'll do one quick, quick hot take. Uh, technology frames behavior. I mean, I think anyone who's a game designer has noticed that technology can frame possible behavior. And I, I want to say, I feel like for loops are an act of violence. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my hot take, as I promise it's the only one. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say as a disclaimer, I don't think that all abstraction is violence, but that abstraction and action is violence. So in computer programming and math, yes, you look at things as abstract ideas. But, and that's fine, but the problem is that when we take these abstract ideas that are standing in for people and we take action on them, and like taking action on complex ecosystems is deeply violent. The things that don't fit get erased. So for example, if I said for loop, a for loop, anyone who doesn't do code, for each student in this room, feed them a cookie. So first of all, I'm not getting a cookie. This is deeply violent. <laughs> and second of all, someone who can't have who can't have flour, who can't have gluten, might be choking on this cookie that you've just forced in their mouth. And I know this is a silly example, but I, I actually think we need to be thinking about these things when we think about technology and communities. That we need to be thinking about like, how we actually don't know a lot of the time what counts and how to count it. And so for me, this is the, the thing. Why am I here? My practice is completely inseparable from communities and context. And I've asked several times for this talk, like, why are you here? And I've told you about how I answer that question, how it changes. And uh, I'd love to hear from you later the answer to this question, the many answers to your question. And I hope you let this question live for you and change. And I hope it continues to have meaning for you. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna talk some more after the talk. Are you ready? Oh, try, yeah, try to flip the little switch there. I'm ready. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit. I'm gonna ask you some questions, uh, and then it, we're gonna open it up and see if anyone else here has questions. Um, so my first question is: Is there something that you feel you're you're hiding right now in order to not appear different that you want oh to god. share with us? Oh that, my god, so many things. Do, do, you, do you feel like you can pick one <sighs> to reveal? And um, I, I hope that, like, yeah, please, please raise your hands if you feel like you would like this to be a, a safe space for Marie to reveal something that she's hiding uh, to, oh, in order to not be seen as different. Okay, thank you. That was a lot of hands. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one thing that I will share with you that I've been thinking about for a year, basically, and it was for me the inspiration behind the dance closet, is that uh, I perform my gender, uh, my gender expression. Uh, it's a performance. I don't relate to it. You're, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, another question I have. So uh, I guess I understand why you feel like for loops are, are violent. Uh, interesting, I think it's sort of, it's related to maybe your feelings about iteration, since it's, it's an iterative loop, but um, do you feel like it's, is it like the for each kind of construction that's bad, or do you, do you have like objections to like the for as just an incrementing counter, like if I want to do something a hundred times, is that also violent? Also violent. Also violent, okay, good. Because, be because there, there is no do something a hundred times. Right. That is, that is the violence, is this idea that anything can be done a hundred times. It, it can't. I mean, what is this thing about stepping in the same tr stream twice or something? Right, right, because if this one I'm like, okay, as part of my meditation practice for 100 days, I'm going to ring this bell. It's actually 100 different things that uh, I've done. Not, not the same thing, just sort of iterated by a machine 100 times. Yeah, yeah. And like, often it doesn't matter because it's just like, well, I'm going to have 100 T's. Like, who cares? But I feel like this is one of the problems with capitalism. And this is one of the problems with our culture right now is that we say 100 T's and it's just like some weird abstract thing. We don't see the 100 bags of garbage and we don't see the the hundred uh, like water that leaked out of the edges of the tea and it's just like it's not 
We're not looking at things as they are in a moment. Right, they're abstracted, like yeah, you were saying. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and there's something of the kind of the factory stamping process uh, about that. Yeah. Right. So is it violent without the current system? Who knows? Probably yeah. not. We're, we're, we wouldn't be thinking about it the same way without yeah. that system. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I'm really curious about your thoughts on on iteration. It is something of a like a, maybe a, a creed around here, which where I think we. We're trying to question. I, I'm trying to question in certain ways where I'm always wondering, like, okay, well, what are we, are, are we oversimplifying this idea of iteration into something that's bad or, or that's like done the same way every single time, um, or that is not actually connected to the in like individual creative goals? Do you, do, if I were to pose this question, like, okay, so is there such a thing as an iterative process that? Is not like me is not mechanical or violent in that way. Is not abstracted, but it's, is actually connected to your creative questions. Like, what do you think that's possible? What would that look like? Yeah, I think it's totally possible. I haven't really figured it out. Uh, I do think that if we decoupled the word iterative or like even the word agile somehow, I don't know how we would do this. But if we decoupled the word agile from the word speed things would change a lot. Like I think a right. lot of like the Like rapid prototyping? Fast, yeah. Right, okay. Rapid. And yeah, it's good. We want faster than something, but I think we end up thinking as fast as possible. And like, I do this too with games. I want to start experimenting as fast as possible, but that shouldn't mean say it's done as fast as possible or something. I don't know, there's something about the speed that makes the mind not think as deeply and as widely as it could. Right, so like, do you, is it going through the process for the sake of doing iterations, right? Like, I have to do a certain number of iterations and then that's actually what makes the thing done? As opposed to like, it actually, I feel good about it, I feel happy with it, I, I feel like it's, I, you've, you have a, more of an instinctual or intuitive feeling that, it's, that it doesn't need to iterate anymore? Like, yeah, I, I actually don't know. I really like started thinking about my problems with uh, iterative design about a week ago, so mm -hmm. I haven't really expanded on these thoughts that much, but I just thought, why is this such a sacred thing? Anything sacred I want to poke at, you know? Yeah, maybe, maybe it was exposure to too much iteration in this <laughs> ambient radiation uh, in, on the sixth floor. I did live in San Francisco for a while, too, so. Right, yeah, no, that, that, that I'm sure influenced it, but you also, like, your office is right next to Playtest Thursday, uh, every Thursday. Um, Which is wonderful. Yeah, I wonder, it's like, is it, if I were to say something like, sometimes you iterate and it results in you changing absolutely nothing, does that seem weird? No, that sounds, sounds amazing. Right, so like, that seems like it should be possible, right? But somehow that also doesn't sound like what, what the usual practice is. Like that you would go and you would play test something and you'd be like, actually, this confirmed everything that I already believed. But the weird thing is that that should be possible, right? Just like you sometimes run an experiment and it actually does, it like your hypothesis is confirmed, right? So just as often you should be able to play to something and be like, nope, everything is fine. <laughs> like maybe there are some things that I want to change. There's still, still stuff on my to-do list, right? But in terms of the questions that you were trying to, the things that you were trying to test, sometimes you're like, actually everything's fine. Right, it but never, somehow, like, yeah, it never it never happens because of like that we don't expect it to happen. Mm -hmm. We expect like, oh, well, somebody's going to tell me that something they don't like, and um, and then I'm going to have to like re respond to that as an artist with pride, but also sensitivity for my audience or something like that. I don't know. Am I in, getting any closer to like sort of poking the what the the BS part of this is? I think we need to just. I think there needs to be a lot of just taking all these ideas apart. Yeah. And just like really just pulling them apart from each other because I think there's a lot of baggage that we inherit from Silicon Valley when we inherit their structures of making things. And so I don't know exactly what's wrong with it or what's implied. I think we would need to like say, oh, what what do we mean? We have to ask a series of questions. Like what do we mean when we say iterative? Like right. yeah, what's yeah. involved in that? Why do we think playtesting is so sacred? Yes, I think playtesting is sacred, but like, why do we, why do we think Right, that? and the, yeah, that's sort of like, what should you be trying to get out of it? Not yeah. like, well, three people said they didn't like it, so I guess I have three days worth of changes that I need to make, <laughs> right, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, um, exactly. Interesting. 
Um, I also I was thinking yeah. when I was when I was thinking about this, I thought, oh, maybe the answer is just to like make lots of really bad things and iterate on none of them. And then I was like, wait, is that different than iterating? Yeah, I don't know if it is. <laughs> for sure, it, it may be like you know more like the, the tr son of iteration or something <laughs> like that, right? Like, but um, but that that's a that is a common practice in a lot of game making communities, yeah. right? Let's just yeah. like like make stuff. Let's do glorious train wrecks and things like that. Yeah, and game exactly. a day kind of yeah, things. Exactly. But there, yeah, can you avoid I iterating on yourself? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> um, so, do you, so I was really curious. By your, <laughs> let me try that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I was curious to see your process. So when you describe the steps of your process, uh, I guess one of the things that came to mind was like, oh, this this seems a lot like a like a designery process, mm. and I don't know, maybe that's related to some of these other topics. Like, do you see a distinction between being a designer, between being an artist? If you're an experimental, if you're doing experimental work, does that push you more towards this, um, like a design type process, which I guess I think of as addressing problems through research, maybe a little bit more than some or li like, you know, wellspring of intuitive, uh, overflowing expression type art practices? Uh, I'll do whatever work people will pay me for, basically. So. It also sounds like a design process. <laughs> um, uh, I think of myself as an artist, but then when I think about what I do, I think I do design. So that's very I know, that makes sense. Uh, I, I feel like I'm an artist because I make art, uh, but I also feel like I kind of described, I feel in a lot of ways like my body is or myself, like I'm broken. Uh, and when I say that, I mean broken in relation to my community. I feel like, a, I feel broken, you know? I, I have chronic health problems, I have mental health problems, I have a lot of problems. And I guess all my design has to kind of do with that. I was talking to my friend Ida about this. Anytime I do anything, I have to talk to my friends. Like I have this like network of people that I, I call and I say, oh, I have to give a talk tell me what I'm thinking about. Uh, and I called my friend Ida, and Ida said, eventually, like, it really sounds to me like you're talking about your practice, and that your practice is, the world is hard for you, how do you make it survivable? Uh, that that was, <laughs> that was the core yeah, of it. Right, right, and uh, interestingly, maybe that's different than, so, you know, there's this sort of famous and somewhat hoary line that, like, design is about solving problems for people. And, but what you were saying about, um, experiments and not being like experimental frontierism, right, is that maybe connected to the idea that actually the problems you're solving are not like, how, you know, how do I turn on a light more easily? Well, I clap my hands and then the light comes on, like design problem. Um, so that was a real, uh, you know, why, why aren't those everywhere now? Um, <laughs> But instead, like you're looking at a problem that sort of exists deeper than your soul, or in the sort of connections or or disconnections that are that are happening with yeah. you and your communities. Yeah, and I really didn't talk much in the talk about technology. Technology is a huge part of my practice, but I thought it was an about a 50 minute talk already, and that that was a lot. Uh, but I often feel when I'm working with technology, because almost all my work involves being critical about some kind of technology. Each of these projects has a problem, but also I didn't go into how each one of these projects relates to a technology, and I really like to work with technologies that are hype technologies, because I feel like there's an interesting intersection between like human problems and hype technology problems. You know, like right now we're struggling more than ever before with trust, and then suddenly it's like blockchains everywhere, or we're struggling with like our world collapsing and suddenly it's VR everywhere, or we're struggling with like free will and agency, and then suddenly everybody's talking about like quantum uh, physics, and it's just like, I don't know, I feel like when people talk about, I, it's fun for me to work on problems and technologies and like 
what's happening there. Like, I don't know, maybe there's nothing happening there, but it's an interesting space for me. Right, so the trustless decentralized communities, is that sort of like blockchain related stuff? <laughs> okay, wow, and you found that there was nothing there? Or that they're not really trustless? They're not uh, trustless, no. No but, system is without, tr you have to trust something. You're trusting your computer. You trust the blockchain. You're trusting, yeah, well I mean. It, you, you mastered it and now you trust it and it's mastered you. <laughs> Like you're trusting your own security of your own computer, you're trusting the, the architecture set up by the engineers, you're, I mean, nobody's reading through all that code. Like, don't tell me someone's reading through all the code. But interestingly, you don't trust all the people who went through the same processes of learning to trust the blockchain that you did. Those are the people you don't have to trust. The only people. <laughs> you don't people have to trust exactly. <laughs> because instead you you deposited your trust in the blockchain. Wait, so did you you use that as the basis of that was part of your research process for one of the games that you showed? Yeah, exactly, for Common. Ah, uh, for Common, okay. Common was about decentralized communities. Uh, so I was reading a lot about uh, like the tragedy of the commons and I read a lot about uh, this person Eleanor Ostrom. Has anyone heard of this person? Mm -hmm. Frank's like, yes, I love Eleanor Ostrom. But she's yeah. incredible. Yeah, she's, she's she's incredible. A, yeah, she, amazing economist. She yeah. really, uh, you know, she, I was trying to say some things and, and I was not finding anyone. Like I was looking for some, I had some questions and, and I had some ideas and I wasn't finding anyone and then I found her ideas and I was like, oh, here's someone who's saying that actually the tragedy of the commons is not inevitable and that given like certain criteria and certain circumstance, people are very good at managing resources together. Right, you could actually have sharing economies and things like yeah, that. Yeah. It was exactly. interesting how she, she managed to go against the grain but still be sort of like very respected as a mainstream economist too. And won a Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And people are still like, the tragedy of the commons is inevitable and then she's over there with her Nobel Prize. Uh, well, I mean, well, I think she's passed. A lot of us love that type of stuff around here so I have to ask, like how, how do you feel like common went in terms of like, did everyone just get cast into the void? You made it sound so ominous. And yet when you were describing that horrible, like, you're alone forever in the void, I'm like, that probably happened to everybody who played that game. It did happen to some people. You can always get invited back in, uh, so... Are, are people still playing it? No, it's because off, I, I didn't it's want a, to... a time-limited game. I didn't want to play with the server anymore. Right, yeah, no, I don't blame you. So then everyone was cast into the void when you turned off the server. Yeah, but I sent them, I sent them a relapse of the thing, so they're kind of like... Oh, okay, in, yeah. the, in the GIF, they're there forever. Well, okay, so yeah, so they're preserved in an afterlife. <laughs> That's beautiful, thank you, God. <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, I'm not serious. She's, she like made it, so uh, and uh, it's preserved. Uh, every every multiplayer online uh, game community should be so responsible. Uh, Eric and I made one, and it sort of mostly just sits there empty most of the time, except when someone posts on our Facebook group, being like, "Does anyone want to play?" And then oh. they show up for five minutes. It's still there. Yeah, it's You're still paying. There. Yeah. yeah, I guess are, are we paying for it. Who's who, who's getting the bill for that? <laughs> Ranjit, okay, thanks, Ranjit. Thanks, Ranjit. Um, yeah. Um, Art. Yeah, with that game, actually, I, I don't know, I thought I was going to mention this in the talk, but I didn't, but with that game, I learned something really funny about uh, accounts. So basically, any person who can barely even code can technically set up a database and set up accounts and invite you to join this game and be like, oh, make a username and make a password. And then that person can have that password sent to their email in plain text. And I was like, oh, all these services. I mean, I use pretty secure passwords in general, but like you see a username and a password go away into the computer and you think, that's gone somewhere safe, definitely. There are standards for this. People can't just do whatever they want, but no. You can do anything you want with that information. And I, I, I tried to share it on social media. Like I was like, listen, people, it's dangerous out there. Don't be reusing your passwords. I mean, I know everyone's been saying this forever, but don't. And all I got were responses from people who were saying to me, I can't believe you used this insecure password management system. Right. Like, As a game designer, you're responsible. And I was like, Nobody out there is doing that <laughs> except for you, irresponsible person. How dare you be so different? No, only yeah. kidding. Everyone's <laughs> doing it. I'm sorry. Don't use your passwords. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bad bad world out there in a lot of ways. On that note, um, does anybody else have questions that they'd like to ask me? Oh, a lot, a lot, lots of people. All right, in the back, you were first. Uh, when you enter a new community, what are the things about that community that influence or affect you the most? And how does playing a game with that community affect those influences? Whoa, big question. Good question. Okay, so... When, should we repeat it for the for the mics? Okay. When I enter a community, how? Wait. 
Can you can you do it? Wait, can you when? <laughs> <laughs> What are the characteristics? Oh yeah, so there are a lot of characteristics of communities that affect me. Absolutely, I'm the most sensitive person I know. So I enter into a community and I'm just like a little sponge. Like I'm like, what is happening? Power relations, how people are relating to each other, how they relate to me, all of it is kind of going in to whatever it is that I am, this self that is potentially a thing. Um, and then, yeah, all of it. All of it is impacting me all the time. Uh, like your energy, for example. Like the moment I saw you, like laughing, friendly, bringing people around you, like all of this impacts me immediately. And I think we all do impact each other in this way. Uh, and the question about playing games with people. I don't know, I love playing my games with people. Like I make games for, for people to play together. And uh, I love watching people play them. Uh, most of my games are terrible for couples. Uh, hopefully no couples have broken up because of my games, but there have been a lot of angry, angry fights. Uh, I don't know why they're so bad for couples. They're great for siblings. Um. <laughs> right, because uh, used to fighting maybe, or some, some, something about the nature of fighting yeah. between siblings and couples. That's interesting. Or like they know what to expect from each other or something. But I feel like I didn't fully answer the question. Did I, did I miss? Well, I guess, like, do you think those uh, games can affect those power structures that you mentioned in ways that like, you don't anticipate? Yeah, I mean, when I make my games, I have these questions and I have these ideas and I kind of put them out there as a platform. And sometimes I think of it as like, I'm creating a space for people to teach me how not to feel alone or something. Or like I'm creating a space to learn. Like I want to learn, I want everyone else to learn, whatever. But it's like a very, the games that I make are often like, they're, they're designed, definitely, but there's a lot of open space. There's a lot of, show me what you do with this. Uh, and I think I do have impact on communities. That, that, that frightens me, actually, to think that I might be like, for example, going somewhere, somewhere other country, some other community, and, and impacting people in a negative way. Like, that, that's terrifying to me. Uh, but I also hope that like, maybe I'm impacting them in a positive way, that like, my games are, or in a neutral way, but just that they're, they're going and they're playing and that it's creating a new space for them. Do you have any nice stories from people who played your games together and they were like, we became friends or anything like that? Uh, yeah, to totally. Yeah, uh, those are good. Yeah, so many, so many, so many friend, new friend stories uh, and people who, especially with, the, with uh, the one where people are jumping together, like they really felt connected afterwards. Uh, yeah. Good job. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I have to ask one, one follow-up question to that, which is, so we, we invited you here. Um, Thank you. And you're, it turns out you're a little sponge. Um, so now I have to ask you, maybe you're, you've, you're, maybe you're in like an engorged sponge now after several months. Yeah. Um, or like, what, what is your, what's your impression of the community and the dynamics at the Game Center? Okay, big question, Naomi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way, this is so... so well, space raise space raise your hand if you, if, you, if you feel like you're okay with whatever Marie says in, in response to this question. What? You're just like okay with it. Interesting. Yeah, we're, we're, we're okay with it. Okay. Uh, so, I feel like it's an interesting space. So one thing for me that I've noticed over my time here is I've actually... At first, the space seemed to me uh, like people were kind of like really clustered in these like kind of hyper clusters. Uh, but over time, I kind of saw people loosening and kind of like cross pollinating in ways that were interesting. Uh, something that I find fascinating about this space in particular with the faculty is how much students talk to faculty. Like it's actually quite a lot. I don't know if it's the mentorship programs, um, but I see a lot of students going to faculty a lot. And like, I'm sorry, Charles, but I hear everything that happens in your office, as I'm sure you hear everything that happens in mine. Um, so like, I, I hear a lot of like the relation between people, like students looking for help, looking for guidance, and getting help and guidance. One thing I haven't seen that I would really love to see at the Game Center is like more vulnerability from the faculty towards the students. Like, hey, we're fallible people. We're trying to figure this out. Um, I'm not saying that you're not vulnerable, but like there is this weird power relationship in education where, where it's like it's just complicated. Uh, you are going to be here for a while, and you're going to see so many students come and go, and. Uh, 
you're in this position, which is kind of like like we are right now, you know, like I'm up on this stage, I'm up on the high seat, and the teachers can be like that. And I wonder sometimes if like faculty felt more, I don't know, I don't even know how you would do this, because like how would you create new vulnerability and new connection with everyone? I, I have no idea yeah, how you would do that. I, I think it's tricky. I think it's, uh, well, there's a difference between vulnerability and insecurity, right? Maybe yeah. that's the tricky thing, yeah. because, you, you know, there, there could be like an absence of comfort that you suddenly feel if like, you came to school and like all the faculty members were just like, we had our heads on the desk and we were crying. <laughs> and we'd be like, crying? yeah, you'd be like, am I, is it a good idea for me to get this degree? <laughs> the faculty are all crying. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. So that, that was something. I also have been like really noticing the space, so I know this is a new space, but it's like, I think it's still, people are still figuring out how to use the space. Like what does it mean? How do people like find space for themselves removed, but how do people connect with each other? How does the space operate? And like how do people occupy the space? I really think that there should be a nap room. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Maybe my office should become the nap room. I don't know if it's been promised to anyone. Yeah, well, we'll see. We may have to figure out what to do that with that in the spring. I, I've, I have officially pro proposed a cozy corner, Ooh, that's which nice. is that's nice. by the entrance to, to the uh, Remu area in front of the... the uh, well, unfortunately, it shares a wall with the smallest nightclub that I've ever, <laughs> uh, ever seen. <laughs> Don't worry, it's one night only. Okay, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's a relief. I think after that it might become up. the crying room or something. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I saw some meetings happening in there the other day. It's two people who are having a, a stand-up because there's no room to sit down in it. Um, <laughs> thank you for laughing at that bad joke. Um, all right, let's take some more questions from someone who's not me over here. Uh, yeah, the last step of your process is about sharing. Uh, who do you share to? Is it everybody or like how you share all your work, I know you cut videos, but like, is it to the community that you made it for, or is it to individuals, is it to every single person in the world, like, mm. what's the process of it? Yeah, so I, how do I, how do I share my work and who do I share it with? Um, I absolutely have people who I feel are my people, like my most intimate community, which is like very special to me because I have not stayed anywhere for longer than two years in the last 10 years, so, those people I share almost everything with, uh, and I share like the most intimate parts of the work, like the feelings of failure, all the things, I share everything with them. Um, and then I have like a second tier of sharing, which is often these blog posts, which are very oversharey, and I share those kind of like publicly with my social networks and with people. Uh, I feel like they give a lot, but obviously not everything. Um, there are some things that I really like, just never feel comfortable sharing, so like maybe working on a project and, and then not getting paid. Or like working on a project and there being like weird power dynamics with someone. Uh, that never goes in my documentation. That only goes to my special people. I feel very complicated about it because I always want to share it, but there's this, I don't, I don't want, I don't want the conflict. Like it feels like it's like so much, it's so expensive. Like conflict is so expensive on our hearts, you know? And so that stuff is more like, if someone comes and asks me, I'll tell them, uh, but it's only inner circle. And then there's the blog posts, which are broader, and the videos, which are broader still. And then I'll actually bring my work sometimes to specific communities, like Slack groups, or Facebook groups, or whatever they are, where I have people that I know are excited about what I'm doing. Uh, and in terms of like future work, I also have curators who ask me, what are you working on? I wanna know what you're working on next. And I generally don't send it to them because I'm scared that they'll invite me to things and it's too overwhelming, so I just don't reply to those emails. Yeah. <laughs> Good policy. <laughs> Wait, so, and you mentioned your, your music you don't share with anyone, not even, Never. Not even your close circle of friends. It's not even, for you. Like not even in bed with a right. lover, yeah. Do, do you feel like that's that uh, f in some way affect the rest of your work, like having something that's super private? Does it ever fertilize your other types of work? So I don't understand how people share their art. Like, I know I'm doing it right now, but uh, yeah. when I made music, anytime I tried to play for anyone, I would just notice what they liked, and then I would just try and do more of that. Uh oh, this is an iteration problem again. I'm a people pleaser, uh -huh. is the problem. I'm a contrarian and a people pleaser, and it is the worst combination. It really is. Uh, so... I just want to play them whatever they liked. Okay, they like open tuning on this guitar. Oh, they like this like pretty trill on a synth. Oh, they like percussion that actually makes sense. And so I just do more and more of that. And then like the soul would start at least like slipping out of it. Like this like 
feeling of engagement and excitement would just like drain out of the bottom of the thing until I didn't want to make music anymore. Well, that, that, that does make sense. And it makes sense maybe why you found your way to games too, where you have to simultaneously please and torture people. <laughs> uh, so you can be a contrarian and also people pleaser and be like, but no. <laughs> but I really struggle with games at the same thing. But the thing with games is that they're for other people, so I can't hide them. Right, if I could, right if I had like robot friends who would play my games, none of you would ever play them. They would just be for the robots. Don't, don't tell Marie about the work that's being done over in, uh, in uh, Tandon. I'm not even going to say any more about that. Um, all right, some other questions. Given your spongy nature, it sounds like there's a sort of implicit step zero of your work, which is something like community selection and then maybe anthropology to figure out what the red flags and what the cool things are about various communities. And I, I, I relate to that too. It's like a step of my process too. But I'm curious what your, um, what are those for you? Like the chronic red flags and patterns of good community that you see. Mm, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so step zero, step zero being like looking for communities um, and uh, looking for flags. I don't know how to describe this. Uh, I think it feels like a very intuitive process. And I've always actually felt that intuition is not a feeling thing, that intuition is a thinking thing. It's just like thoughts that aren't necessarily identifiable. Uh, I notice in certain communities, I notice when things feel really stuck. Uh, I notice when people seem really stuck, like when they w can't say what they feel. It's very obvious when people are never taking risks or something. Like it's very obvious when people are never saying anything dangerous, like that they feel scared. And I'm not saying that I don't like that community, but it is probably a less fertile community for me. Uh, ideally, there is some, some trust, some vulnerability, some openness, uh, and people taking some risks so when I so it's like absence of things that I see. I see absence of people like when I'm when I'm when I'm looking for a community, I'm looking for people like saying things and I'm looking for a lot of people saying a lot of things. And I'm using the word saying as kind of a metaphor here, but like a lot of different people expressing, a lot of different people collaborating. Um, this is what I look for. But like I honestly can't be that picky. Like I I follow money opportunities for my work. I usually pay my rent with some kind of weird side job. So, like for example, I worked for SoundCloud as the editor of the developer blog, uh, and that was how I paid rent. I also made money off my games, but of course, like not much. So I worked half a day a week at SoundCloud and this sort of thing. So, I guess what I'm saying this is that like geographically and situationally, like when I'm looking for a space to be, it relates to where I am. Uh, but there are things that will make me just like back out of a room and like close the door very quietly so no one notices me. And it's usually these like weird stiff silences and like especially bodies that have been marginalized. So these like might be women's bodies, these might be racialized bodies. But if these bodies are like turning away and closing down, uh, this is for me like a major red flag uh, that I'll be like backing out of, or if, if there are no bodies like that, uh, for example, in the room, like if the room seems like very uh, mono, mono anything, like monocultural, mono uh, ideas, uh, which is not an argument for like, I don't know, lately I've seen all this, I don't know if anyone else has seen this, but on the news, I keep hearing people talk about like thought diversity and what they mean by that is like some people being like racist bigots and then other people talking and they're like, oh, it's thought diversity. <laughs> And I don't mean that. I just mean like people, like I'm like, oh, iterative design, here are the problems. And you say, iterative design, here's why it's exciting. And someone else is like, I made up my own design. This is exciting too. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Maybe even from like, uh, if you want to ask Marie about how she finds all these funding opportunities to pay the rent, I'm sure yeah, yeah. some people yeah, please wonder do. about that. Clara? Oh, please, please, please set a good example, Clara, and phrase your question in the form of a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not like thanking you for talking about like experimentation as failure and like being okay with failing. Because the thing that was part of the anxiety that we have as artists, as people making things, is that we feel that we cannot fail. And, and like 
even you talk about like, you know, experimentation, failing, shutting things down, recoiling, and that's okay. I think that we need to hear that more from artists and from people in general. I think that, you know, as part of the practice, you know, that, that's it's heartwarming but also like more reassuring. I think that, that that's great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Failure. Failure. Anyone have yeah. failure? So many yeah. different lenses on failure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a failure. All right. Yeah. Any other any other questions from Marie? Yeah. Um, so you spent about four years in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three, three, yeah. Yeah, something. Um, I, I always get this sense that it's sort of this enchanting place for artists mm -hmm. and art and creativity and various scenes and communities and innovative music and games, what, what do you feel like a community like this, now that you've been here, can learn from where the, the community in Berlin, mm -hmm. and, you know, cautionary or interesting or insightful? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like one of the reasons Berlin has traditionally been so rich is because it was cheap. And unfortunately, that's not happening. Like, that's not something we can learn from. Uh, it was cheap and so people came from all over Europe to live there and to make art. Uh, it's like so sad that we live in this world where we're so dictated by finances. Uh, but uh, I, I feel like that is what makes Berlin really rich. That's the thing. It's like literally people who have vision and curiosity and excitement being able to afford their rent and their food and like people's lives not getting drained away working three jobs just to pay their rent and like kill the cockroaches in the fridge you know like that I feel like when you have no space for even like taking care of yourself how can you make art uh, that's not a very nice answer you know what I think I can give up uh, also another answer I think uh, that is true I think that's true but but I think that uh, New York, from my experience so far, and I've really loved New York, but like New York could really benefit from like taking a breath. Like in Berlin, on Sundays, everybody like, oh, I'm a world famous techno DJ. Oh, I'm a, I'm a whatever, working on making open frameworks, like whoever you are. Everybody is going into the park and they're sitting on a blanket and they're having a fizzy water or a beer or something and they're just relaxing. Every Sunday, all the stores close down. Uh, and I, I feel like this is something I loved about Berlin. It's, it's why I'm going to Montreal after this, because it's the closest I could find in Canada. But is this like work-life balance? It's making space for like, is the word fallow? What does that word mean? Yeah, fallow, fallow is where yeah, you leave a field without planting more new seeds in it so yeah. that the soil can become more enriched. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like more fallow spaces. More time where there's nothing, just just space for people to be and be calm and and then be be impatient to get back to work uh, to make art. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. All right. Yeah, George. I think the thing about New York is it used to be like that. Yeah. The time in yeah. New York we had that. We no longer do because it's too expensive to do anything here anymore. It sucks. And I want to. <laughs> Sometimes we have it in the summer when everyone goes to the beach for a second, yeah. right? Like that sort of exists still in a, in a little bit, in a little cracks and spaces. Yeah. For the first snowfall. I can't believe you all have listened to me talk for this long. I'm so impressed. <laughs> well, if you have any other questions for me, we'll be sticking around up here for a little bit. Thank you guys all so much for, for coming to hear Marie speak. Uh, thank you to Marie for being here all semester with us and uh, absorbing some of our community, making some interesting work, talking with so many of us, uh, and, and teaching and everything else. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you've been here, and Marie will be here through the, the end of the semester. Semester. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So definitely, please feel free to still stop by and chat with her yeah. uh, if you are around the game center. All right. Big hand. Uh, round of applause for me, please.